Welcome to Reading 3.3 of Finance Data Professional Certification. To start off, let's understand what is regression and why do we need regression. Let's say that the head of the Department of Marketing reached out to you to help him understand how the advertising budget on various media drives sales. So you get access to the past data where each row represents the advertising expenditure on the three media, that is TV, newspaper, and radio, and the corresponding sales. And now you get down to business. Now, as a consultant, you like to be thorough and create a comprehensive recommendation for your boss. Some questions naturally pop in your head. First, is there any evidence of association between advertising budget and sales? If not, then it's not even worth spending money on advertising. Second, if such a relationship exists, then how strong it really is. Third, among the three media, that is TV, radio, and newspaper, is it that all the three contribute to sales or only a few? Fourth, if I increase, say, TV budget by $1,000, what will be the impact on sales? Fifth, if I know the advertising budget, can we predict the future sales? Sixth, is the relationship between sales and advertising budget linear? Seventh, is there a synergy effect or interaction effect? Meaning, if we invest $50,000 on TV and $50,000 on radio, does it generate more or less than investing $100,000 on either of the media individually? Turns out that linear regression can answer all these questions. Linear regression formulates y, the dependent variable, as a linear function of x, the independent variable. Beta 0 and beta 1 are called the parameters of regression model, which we will learn from the data. Now the dependent variable y is the one we want to predict or explain, which in our case is sales. The independent variable is the one which we use to explain y. So x is also called as the explanatory variable. In our case, x could be, let's say, the TV budget. Notice that I have used the symbol y is approximately modeled as a linear function of x, which also can be read as regressing y on x. But why can't I use y equals to a linear function of x? For obvious reasons. If y is an exact linear function of x, then I only need two equations to determine beta 0 and beta 1. But in our case, in the data, we have so many rows or observations, and this equation has to do justice to all. If our data set contains n observations, there will be n equations and only two unknowns. In mathematics, it's called as an over-identified system, where there are more number of equations than unknowns. And that's why we seek the best approximate linear fit between y and x. We can, however, obtain equality if we introduce an error term. The error term is the part of y which could not be captured or explained by x. If we have just one explanatory variable x, say tv, then we call it simple linear regression model. If we have more than one x, then we call it multiple linear regression. Next, we will set up a very simple linear regression problem and make an important distinction between population dynamics and sample dynamics in the context of regression. Consider all humans on planet Earth. That's our population. We wish to establish a linear relationship between the weight of a person and the height of that person. Now obviously we cannot study the whole population. So we collect a sample of five people which is a random subset of the population. Now we will collect the weight of every individual in let's say kilograms and height of that individual in centimeters. 
and we can plot y and x. Now in the population, if y truly has a linear relationship with x, then every person's weight will be the same linear function of his height, including these five persons in our study. Graphically, a linear function is a straight line. Beta 0 controls the intercept of the line. And beta 1 controls the slope or steepness of the line. Beta 0 and beta 1 together define the line or the linear relationship. Now for every height x, the weight y is composed of two parts. The first part is called the systematic part, which is explained by the height. It means that height systematically influences the weight of a person across the entire population through this linear dependence. The leftover part, which is not explained by height, is captured by the error term u, which is also called as the idiosyncratic part of y. The idiosyncratic part captures the weight impact of all other nuances of that specific individual except height, such as eating habits, diseases, lifestyle, etc., which acts as either positive or as a negative add-on to the systematic component. Now this add-on is unique for every person. Note that in our case, the error term is negative for the fourth and fifth observation. Here is a very important concept. While all of these is happening in the population, we don't see everything in the sample. We don't know the true parameters beta 0 and beta 1, and so we don't know the true line. We don't know the error terms either. All we observe is just the x and y. And we have to estimate everything else. Using some technique, let's say, on the sample data, we learned the parameters beta 0 and beta 1. We call these parameter estimates. And we denote them as beta 0 hat and beta 1 hat. Once we estimate these parameters, we estimate the line and we get the fitted values of y, also called as y hat. y hat is our prediction of y given x, which is equals to beta 0 hat plus beta 1 hat times x at each point. As a byproduct of this, we also get the leftover portion of y, which is not captured by this line. And that's our estimate of the error term, also called as u hat. We call them as fitted errors or residuals. Now, if the parameter estimates change because a different sample is used or a different estimation technique is used, then all estimates change. Here is a visual that summarizes the distinction between the population process and the sample process for ith observation. Pause the video for a minute and understand what's observed and what's not observed, what's actual and what's estimated. Anything that is not observed is obviously estimated. Note that x and y that we observe or measure can come with measurement errors which will differ from the actual values. But we are keeping things simple and assume what is observed is what is actual, at least for now. Now let's familiarize with scalar and vector representation of the regression equation, which is needed before we derive the beta coefficients. Let's start with the advertising data set that we previously looked at. Let's say there are n observations I can write the regression model 
as n scalar equations, one for each row. Or in vector form, I can write all these equations as one vector equation. Sales vector is equal to beta 0 times vector of 1s plus beta 1 times TV budget vector plus vector of error terms. Which can be more compactly written as this. Vector y equals to matrix x times beta vector plus error term vector. And this is the most commonly used format to represent a regression equation. Here x is called the design matrix which has the first column as vector of 1s. The first column gets multiplied with beta 0 and serves as the intercept for all the n scalar equations. The second column is the actual predictor or explanatory variable vector. The simple regression may also be seen as multiple regression where the first variable is not really a variable but a constant vector of 1s. If we do not need the intercept term in the regression, then we can drop the first column from the design matrix. Note that for multiple linear regression with more than one independent variables, we just keep adding the variables as additional columns in the design matrix and keep adding one beta coefficient per variable to the beta vector. That's all for now. In the next couple of videos, we will learn how to estimate these beta coefficients from a statistic standpoint and a linear algebra standpoint. Machine learning students face a bit of identity crisis in this regard. I see that machine learning community approach regression from an optimization standpoint as any other ML algorithm and in the process a lot of the crucial statistical assumptions get ignored or mixed up. As a machine learning student, you need both perspectives. Trust me, it's worth it. If you liked the video, please subscribe to this channel to get latest educational content on statistics, finance, risk management, and analytics. Also, if you are a finance professional and looking for a certification in data science, log on to peakstotails.com and check out our prep course for finance data professional, which is a global certification offered by FDP Institute. Experience a new way of learning complex mathematical and statistical concepts with rich visualization in an easy-to-follow Microsoft Excel-based environment. Take advantage of our mind maps and Excel-based hands-on modeling sessions.